Theodore Roosevelt once said, the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena. I believe there's a hero in all of us that keeps us honest, gives us strength, makes us noble. So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Seize the day whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself in a worthy cause. And I'm going to stay right here and fight for this lost cause. You've got to get mad. I mean plum mad dog man. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Who at best, if he wins, knows the thrills of high achievement, and if he fails, at least fails while daring greatness. I'm going to show you how great I am. Hi once again, everybody. I'm Ed Berliner, and welcome into The Man in the Arena, live on Facebook. Thanks so much for joining us. We were told a couple of weeks ago that we were entering an historic moment in American history. Little did we know exactly how historic it would actually be. Certainly the impeachment process of Donald John Trump was something that everybody talked about and everybody was watching. But what has happened in the days following the impeachment has become something more than just a little bit interesting. It has indeed become part of history. Because quite frankly, we have never, whether it's Republican, Democrat, Independent, doesn't make a difference how you want to slice it, we have never quite seen someone in politics go on such a victory lap after basically being told... You're free and clear. Well, actually, the president is not free and clear in so many ways. However, he is certainly the first to be able to tell us. The quote-unquote press conference, or should I say the celebration that he had at the White House, was interesting because I don't think anyone has ever seen anything like it at the White House. And certainly we've never seen this sort of gloating, if you will. Republicans will say it is absolutely necessary and it is worthy. Democrats will say it's an insult. Well, for our purposes to go ahead and start out today, you can go ahead and make up your... We've been going through this now for over three years. Uh, it was evil. It was corrupt. It was dirty cops. Uh, it was leakers and liars. And this should never, ever happen to another president, ever. It's not anything. It's just we're sort of, uh, it's a celebration because we have something that just worked out. I mean, it worked out. We went through hell unfairly, did nothing wrong, did nothing wrong. I've done things wrong in my life, I will admit. <laughs> not purposely, but I've done things wrong. But this is what the end result is. We first went through Russia, Russia, Russia. It was all bullshit. They made up facts. A corrupt politician named Adam Schiff made up my statement to the Ukrainian president. He brought it out of thin air, just made it up. They say he's a screenwriter, a failed screenwriter. He tried to go in. Unfortunately, he went into politics after that. <laughs> Remember, he said the statement, which is a mob statement. Don't call me, I'll call you. I didn't say that. We did a prayer breakfast this morning, and I thought that was really good. In fact, that was so good it might wipe this out. But by the end, by the time we finish, this will wipe that one out, those statements. <laughs> I, had, uh, I had Nancy Pelosi sitting four seats away, and I'm saying things that a lot of people wouldn't have said, but I meant every, <laughs> I meant every word of it. They're vicious and mean, vicious. These people are vicious. Adam Schiff is a vicious, horrible person. Nancy Pelosi is a horrible person. But I can tell you, in my opinion, these are the crookedest, most dishonest, dirtiest people I've ever seen. Republicans applaud Donald Trump. Democrats do not. Now we get to discuss not only this, but what happened in Iowa. Hillary Clinton is talking, and there is so much more for this episode of The Man in the Arena. And by the way, our comment section is open for those of you watching this show live. Let me bring in our guest, because I first saw her politically opine as part of the CNN Capitol Gang in the 90s through the double aughts. 
Uh, she was the first female columnist at Time Magazine. She's now a columnist for the Daily Beast. It is a pleasure to welcome Margaret Carlson into the arena. Margaret, put on your gloves. Thanks for joining us. Woman in the arena. <laughs> You are now in the arena, just like we are all in the arena right now, I believe, because uh, it is. this is the arena that we are now in politically. But let me start out by, by asking you this. Instead of being just a, a, an arena, is America a little more than really just a, a bad political reality show at the moment? Because it seems as if one day we're discussing the possibility of actually governing, and the next day we're watching grown adults actually in a sandbox. The State of the Union had some reality TV moments, uh, some moving, the Tuskegee Airmen, the child getting uh, into the school, uh, the soldier being reunited with his family. I think Rush Limbaugh was a little too partisan a person to get the Medal of Freedom and on the spot, the way it's never done, <laughs> like it was a drive-by Medal of Freedom. <laughs> um, but Trump is very good at it. And the speech overall was very good. And nobody, what is it that's saying that, you know, it, the lies never catch up with you. They go around the world before anybody stops them. So nobody really knows that the economic figures don't support what he said. It goes out there and he read the teleprompter and it was, it was as good as he can be. Is that not the, the bigger case? I think you might have struck on it because... Well, not only the Trump administration, but any administration, any politician of any stripe, they will spit out numbers and figures, and they will say, we've done this and we've done that. But people don't have, well, they do have, they've got their phones sitting right in front of them. They can check just about anything. But most people don't really check these facts. I mean, it is true that most of what Trump said in the State of the Union was completely false. But it doesn't make any difference to those who are Republicans and follow Donald Trump. They, they love it simply because he will say it. And they love it because he will stick it in the face of the Democrats and he doesn't care. And Democrats throw up their arms and go, oh, how could you throw lies out there like this? It's terrible. It doesn't make any difference, Margaret. He can say whatever he wants. But could we not say that of just about any politician? Well, you hit on something really important and crucial and critical, and that may define the campaign. Trump lies better than Democrats tell the truth. And so his showmanship is such that he's convincing. When I'm watching it, I'm convinced, even though I vaguely know, well, there's the Obama economy, his last three quarters are better than Trump's three, last three quarters and all of that. But nonetheless, he says it with gusto. And like the casino owner he is, he throws the dice. So it, 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 may, it, it may not please, you know, Trump voters, but I'm going to concede that he lies better than Democrats tell the truth. Let's stay on the media, because I know we have a lot to talk about with Iowa, but seeing as we've, we've sort of gone off on the media here for a moment, let's stay there. Because the day after the State of the Union address, I'm looking around at the various networks, because, again, cable networks are the 24-7 pound on the head constantly. That's what they are supposed to do. And what caught me was a long package, a feature from Stephanie Rule on NBC, which started to discuss the effects of the impeachment and the State of the Union. And it, it was exceptionally long, but here, I just want to bring a couple of minutes here uh, of Stephanie Rule's commentary and reporting, if you will, and then let's discuss on the other side. It was no surprise that the president was going to come in hot talking about the economy. I am thrilled to report to you tonight that our economy is the best it has ever been. We are at historic low unemployment rates. The economy is slowly but growing. And look at the stock market. The stock market closed at record highs yesterday. Of course, he would lead with that. But here's what makes absolutely no sense. The president lied about it straight out of the gate. If we hadn't reversed the failed economic policies of the previous administration, the world would not now be witnessing 
this great economic success. That's absolutely not true. We are in the 11th year of economic expansion that started in the Obama administration. The president's right. He created 6.7 million jobs in his first three years. That's impressive. But it's over a million less than Obama created in his last three years. It's really important to note, last night wasn't off the cuff. Last night was a scripted speech, more than a speech. It was a show, a presentation. The Trump administration absolutely knows that people like me are frantically fact-checking every line he is saying, and we're going to point out all of those lies. Think about President Trump, who he was before he was in office. Think about his success as a businessman. His success is in show business. When President Trump ran and operated real businesses, he had a whole lot of failures, over four bankruptcies. I'm talking Trump University, Trump Hotel and Casino, Trump Entertainment, Trump Vodka, Trump Steaks, Take Your Pick, even the Trump Foundation that was just fined $2 million. Those were all failures. Where was the president's super success? TV producing, The Apprentice, a show where he was a hard-charging New York City businessman putting on a business show, and millions of people ate it up. Where his success was, was creating a brand and lending that brand to all sorts of real estate projects. And that's what he's doing here. He is putting on a business and economic show. Margaret, we've heard this story before. We've heard all this before. It is a consistent rehash over and over again. How many times will the press, the legitimate press, even the illegitimate press, continue to pound this into the brains of human beings who just don't give a damn, they don't want to hear it, yet for whatever reason it seems it's an altruistic method, whether it's left or right, that, oh, if we pound it and hard hit it enough, they'll finally get it through their heads. No, it's not going to make a difference. So do we not have to take the media, whatever you want to call it, mainstream media, legitimate press, whatever, to task in basically not doing anything to change anybody's mind or really make a difference in what America's going through right now with what is basically, in many ways, a civil war. Ed, I, I agree. I think it's me, the media barons and the media owners. Um, cable grinds everything to dust. Yes. I don't want to hear it one more time. But now they fill 24-7 uh, and pick your channel. Is it Fox? Is it MS? Is it CNN? And you and 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 I'm numb to it, and I'm sure many of your viewers and listeners are. Um, I long for the day, and this will tell you how old I am, when the newspaper hit the porch in the morning, and Huntley Brinkley and Cronkite told us what happened that day, and we all were operating from the same worldview in a, of the facts, not of the view, take away worldview, but the, the, the facts in the world. Now we have different facts, we have different opinions, and both sides grind it to dust. I want to go ahead now and let's move off the media, if you will, and, and everything with Trump. We may come back to it here, but we've we've got a lot to talk oh, about here. Come back. And they, I, and... They, they deserve more pummeling. <laughs> They deserve a lot of pummeling, which we may just do, but I want to make sure we, we, we get some of the stuff and talk about Iowa here, which might be the biggest disaster I think I've ever seen in politics. I mean, they, they basically today just decided, oh, let's, I, I really think there's somebody sitting in the back in a room in Iowa somewhere with crayons, and they're, they're basically just <laughs> making it up as they go along because they're trying to figure, we got to get something out there real fast because if we don't, somebody's going to be real angry with us now. Because what I think has happened in many ways is Iowa has proven itself to be completely useless at this point when it comes to electing a president. Hey, people in Iowa, no offense, but you're one fiftieth of the United States, and we're already moving on to New Hampshire, so it's not like the world is going to stop. But you said something that I wanted to make sure we bring into the beginning of the discussion here. You, in one of your articles, talked about the Democrats. You said the Democrats better attack Bernie Sanders before it's too late. Isn't it already too late in many ways? Because Bernie Sanders seems to be on a real roll. So let's celebrate the media for one minute. If only the Democrats had listened to me, they might be in better shape. 
Bernie doesn't even call, he doesn't ID as a Democrat. And he's going to take that nomination and he's going to be crushed by Trump. And they just let Wait a minute, I, I want you to say that one more time. He's going to be crushed by Trump, which is what I think a lot of people on the left don't want to believe. And I have been saying that for uh, for months. He will not. But here, here's the argument, I guess, Margaret. People will come in and say, well, wait a minute. Donald Trump is really one of the most unpopular presidents of our time. There's no way that he can win another election. But Bernie doesn't appeal to anybody on the right, no one on the right. What He may even leave a lot of the left behind. There's no way he beats Trump. Say that again. <laughs> well, all Democrats need to take back in, in, in Michigan, for instance, is a few Pilates classes in Ann Arbor. <laughs> but they're not going to get that. They're not going to get that if Democrats want to restructure the economy. And so... This is not the year for any social experimentation. 2024, maybe roll out some progressive plans. But not this year. This is the year to play it safe. And by the way, I don't understand. This is a footnote, Ed. I'm going off topic. Why Elizabeth Warren paid the price for Medicare for All and not Bernie Sanders. He hasn't been questioned about it. He hasn't been asked how much it costs. How are you going to do it? Bernie, you never get legislation through. What do you think is going to happen when you get in? <clears throat> Nobody's ever asked him the tough questions. So going forward, somebody is, and you know who it's going to be? It's going to be Trump. Then why are they asking Elizabeth Warren the tough questions and not putting it to Bernie? There's got to be a reason. Oh, Ed, I'm I'm glad you asked, but now I, I don't want to say because it's so self-serving. Did you <laughs> notice she's a girl? <laughs> yes, I did. It's it's one of the great things that I have. There, there's still a possibility that I'm able to, uh, to look those. Come on, is is it really that simple yeah. and, and really and really that sexist? Um, you know, McConnell said about her, she persists, and there's still a resistance to you know really confident, tough women. Last time, people didn't vote. People who voted for Trump but were independents or swing voters, conservative Democrats said, oh, but, you know, I just didn't like Hillary. Well, now it'll be, I just, you know, I just didn't like that Elizabeth Warren. She was so loud and definite and, and, <laughs> and strident. There, it just happened. It happened. And some of it's that nobody's ever seen a woman in the resolute desk. So what I said earlier about no social experimentation. I'm a wuss, and I'm saying don't experiment, even with Elizabeth Warren, because she, two things, she wants to, to do more restructuring of the economy than people are hungering for. Those swing voters and moderate Republicans are looking for a more honest and dignified and, and someone you can rely on in the Oval Office to do the right thing. Because one of the things about being president, you don't know all the things that are going to come up. So you want to, put, you want to believe in your president's instincts to choose the right thing. Yesterday, for instance, Trump chose all the wrong things. And I won't get all into it, but both the prayer... Yeah, we don't have and three and a half hours to do a show here. Facebook will eventually pull us off, and YouTube will put us into, into purgatory somewhere right, if we do that. Right, I'm just saying, <laughs> his instincts yesterday, I'm not going to get into particulars, because if people have had the TV on for a minute, they know what they are. You don't say BS in the, in the East Room of the White House, and you don't criticize people on religion when they're sitting in the room or not sitting in the room. So his instincts, his first instincts are not good. But to get back to my point, people who might vote against him on, on, on that basis are still not going to go far away from where they're comfortable. And they're not comfortable with a wealth tax and Medicare for all and free health care for immigrants. So it's too much. It's just all too much. And you have to, Democrats have to choose the safest candidate, who to me is beginning to look like Bloomberg. You know, well, hold on. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to. I, I need to get to Mike in a second because I think that's fair. But 
as want is what happens in interviews such as this, you opened a door that I have to step through. You used the H word. <laughs> okay. You you it's used the H word. You said Hill- Hillary uh, out loud, <laughs> which which it doesn't make a difference whether your left or right becomes an immediate flashpoint. Hillary appeared on the Ellen DeGeneres show because she is now touting a new documentary series on Hulu where she also mentions the Monica Lewinsky scandal. And damned if she didn't seem like a candidate in the waiting once again. As I say uh, in the film, you know, you've got to be responsible for what you say and what you say you're going to do. We need to rebuild trust in our fellow Americans and in our institutions. And if you promise the moon and you can't deliver the moon, then that's going to be one more indicator of how, you know, we just can't trust each other. So it's not, it's not good theater. It's not maybe good politics uh, anymore. But I think you should tell people what you mean, mean what you say, and have some sense of responsibility for how you would get anything done that you talk about. So like health care, let's take health care, for example. Look, I want quality, affordable health care for everybody. Um, and I've been fighting for it for more than 25 years. I've been burned in effigy over it, all of that. I want to get there, but let's remember what's at stake. We have a current president who's trying to take away fundamental health care rights. Like, if you have a pre-existing condition, they are in court right now, the Trump administration, trying to take that right away that you got under the Affordable Care Act. So we can have a big argument about Ideally, what kind of health care we should uh, want for everybody, because I'm on the front lines on that battle. But let's remember, if we don't win, people will lose what they have right now. So I just want everybody to understand how high the stakes are and to hold every candidate um, and every public office holder uh, accountable for what they do or they don't do. Hillary now comes out. She's pushing the documentary series. She's talking about Monica Lewinsky. Um, and how terrible a time that was in her life. There's a, a word going out there that maybe she'd look at a vice presidency role. Margaret, I got to tell you, I think that the Republicans sit back every time Hillary Clinton opens her mouth and says, yes, come on, bring it on. <laughs> say something else, baby. We don't care what you say right now, but we just want you to say something because it's going to help us. And on the other side, I think there are Democrats who don't want to say it out loud, but they're going, oh, she's Please, will you just come on, go away, go go vacation, go to the Swiss Alps somewhere for six months and leave us alone, because every time you say something, you're going to damage the effort. Okay, w- which one am I right on, or do I have both? And you're luring me into agreeing with you. <laughs> um, of course I am. That's, I, that's the, way, it's the way talk shows go. <laughs> it is. It is. And I haven't had enough coffee to get up the energy to fight you. The Damn. I admire Hillary Clinton as Secretary of Clinton. I mean, Secretary of State, not necessarily as um, First Lady or a candidate for president. She's been dangling for months. Uh, on another show a few months ago, she said talked about all the people asking her to run, and then she's doing her Sanders thing, right message, wrong messenger. The Clintons don't just have baggage. They have a Louis Vuitton trunk full of things we don't want to have the top lifted up and look at. So they have to be ushered off the stage. Unfortunately, we don't have an elder statesman in the party. Neither neither do the Republicans, for that matter. Um, when we don't have it, I would love a smoke-filled room to sort this out. And somebody go to Clinton and say, listen, it's not helping. Could you please be quiet, please? There's no one to do that. Her message about Bernie Sanders is right, however. If we want to get back to Bernie Sanders, uh, this, is, uh, this would be snatching defeat from the jaws of victory uh, if, if he were to be nominated. But when you say there's no elder statesman in the room, what happened to Joe Biden? Well, the most disturbing thing about well, that's, that's the way that's the way a lot of people start the answer now. Well, <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez, really? Uh, he's off the campaign trail today, back in Wilmington. The official word is, you know, he's meeting with his advisors. That just doesn't look good. 
Iowa wasn't that much of a defeat because Iowa is a mess. You know, the, the crayons in, the, in somebody's hands back there? Actually, they're just doodling. They're not really still, you know, re-canvassing and so many mistakes. Caucuses are a terrible idea. Just get rid of it. He could, he, he, he's lucky that there are people with crayons toting up the totals. Just brush it off. But he's back thinking. This is like Carter with malaise. This is, he has no business doing this. I worry that, that this will be the end for Joe Biden. And you can't have the firewall in, in South Carolina if you don't have a fire. And Joe Biden's not going to come in a fire. He's going to come bing, probably into South Carolina. So then it sounds as if almost where you're going, and at least alluding to maybe, is there's the old white guy. Let's be honest here. I mean, Bernie Sanders is the old white guy that people are always complaining about that basically run the Democratic Party. And then you have the young, very impressionable, Pete Buttigieg, uh, Buttigieg, who's making a tremendous amount of, of, of leaping forward here. But why do I, uh, I, something about him, I just get the feeling that maybe it's not a long haul for him. Where does he fit in all this? You know, he, I will lo- love to fall in love. And it's easy to fall in love with because he talks so beautifully. And he has all these supernumerary characteristics that don't matter, like speaking Norwegian. <clears throat> but it still, you know, affects some people, like he's this Renaissance man. Nobody has ever talked, not even Mayor Pete, about a South Bend miracle. And you know why? There was no South Bend miracle. He talks about winning 80% of the vote in his reelection. That was 8,000 votes out of 10,000 cast out of 100,000 population. Mm. And he was running against a woman of no party who makes jewelry in her basement. So this is not a, a vast vote-getting machine. So um, this might get looked at. Um, and I love listening to him. I mean, don't you like listening to him? He speaks in not just sentences, but paragraphs. He says things that are quite soothing about how to govern because he's right smack in the middle. And aren't we looking for somebody in the middle? Democrats well, are. I, I think he's also a guy who gets it when it comes down to the media because I don't think that Bernie gets it, that Biden gets it, that Warren gets it, because there is a way to work the press to your advantage. And I think as a, as a much younger guy, he understands that. Because let's be honest, Donald Trump won the election because his people brilliantly, absolutely brilliantly, owned social media. And they vaunted him into the presidency. I think Pete understands that. And while I think Biden's best swipe the other day was that, well, I don't know if you want to elect a guy whose highest electable office has been mayor. What? I mean, r- really, that's... I, 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 kind of did a double take at the monitor when I saw that and said, that's the best you can do? Because it seems like that is the best that they can do, because maybe that's his best part. He's not been there and hasn't been infected yet. He hasn't been dipped in the coronavirus of American politics to basically become infectious to everybody else. He's fresh. And maybe that's what the Democrats need for a change, because they haven't had that in how long? Uh, well, I, I can't even, I can't think back that far. Did yeah. JFK seem fresh? <laughs> that did, would be it. Did Obama? I think. Well, no, Obama, Obama would, yeah. Obama fresh. Um, but that's a tsunami that Democrats just are never, are not going to see again probably in my lifetime. Um, you know, if I can just detour once again, Bernie Sanders does do social media pretty well. And every time I write a Bernie column, I hear from them. And it, some of it is, is, you know, not for, you know, tender ears. There's a, <laughs> uh, you know, on, on Buttigieg, uh, there's, there's fresh, but there's also just, you know, there's almost a slight immaturity. I don't, I don't feel that, that he's more like the, 
the guy who won, you know, Model UN by preaching world peace. It's not, he doesn't have a depth. He has an understanding and he's articulate. But articulate is not a good manager, a good leader. I, mm -hmm. I just fear that Buttigieg would not do well against Trump, except in the debates where Trump's act wouldn't play as well because he would be standing next, not to just a, a very calm person, but a person who, who can speak in, in persuasive ways. But the presidency isn't just about talking well. Uh, so I, I don't know that, that he's right for Democrats, Ed. I, I kind of, fresh, yes, but, but not the rest of it. Then let's bring it back because uh, we've, we could actually go for hours here, and I'm, we're, we're going to have you back on again yeah, to discuss. Yeah, I can kill every Democrat, Ed, if you haven't seen enough. <laughs> no, <laughs> you no. Know, no. My, parents were, my parents were Nixon Democrats. Now, my parents were diehard Democrats. Dorothy Day Democrats, they Catholics, they believed wow. in helping the neighbors and, and we always made the casseroles. But then when McGovern came along, they couldn't go there. It was very shocking. I think there are places the Democrats won't go. But will the Democrats go to Mike Bloomberg? Now there is that is that is the question of the moment, if you ask me. Coming out of Nebraska, coming out of uh, New Hampshire, where, what happened? Um, if you lose the electability of Biden because Biden is gone, there's nobody that jumps out of you on that on that debate stage as electable, except. To my mind, Bloomberg, which is why he's going to be on the debate stage in Nevada. I don't think that's because Tom Perez recalibrated his ways of in which you get on stage. I think maybe Democrats, the smoke-filled room that doesn't exist, might see what I see, which is which is Bloomberg could be what's left. And that is, unfortunately, I think, where the Democrats have been heading for some time. They don't want to be there, but I think it is what what is left. And, and I think you've, you've pretty much I did hit not, it. There. I did not see that coming. I, first of all, I thought Biden was just going to pull it out. Really? Um, I did, yeah. Because of the mess that they've, that they've absolutely made of themselves, I mean, there's a... Uh, there's a marvelous cartoon that's on the screen right now from The Hill, which actually came up last year, which has a couple of donkeys. Uh, for those who are listening in on the podcast, one is holding a box of 2020 Democratic debates with fireworks uh, signifying all of the various candidates. And the other donkey says, let's hope they don't blow each other up. I mean, <laughs> come on. That, that, pretty much capt that pretty much captures it to me. And... I still hear a lot of Democrats who say we're blowing it up and we've got we're not making any headway. And again, I think Republicans are rubbing their hands right now going, keep going, baby, keep going, because we got you. And and I think Democrats say, no, you don't. You've got an unpopular president. Republicans say, yes, we do. We, we got him and, and you don't have him. You're going to split your vote so many ways that you're not going to be able to beat him. What happened, Ed, is that Democrats did not impeach Donald Trump, but Republicans impeached Joe Biden. Explain that. What? Hunter Biden was put on trial by Senate Republicans very effectively uh, because, you know, it doesn't it doesn't seem right that your son would suddenly have this post. I can give you all the reasons. I can I can make the case, and I can make the case that take those Senate Republicans, Google their names, and you'll see many of their children with really good jobs in Washington D.C. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> uh, we yeah, almost all of them. I mean, we live by nepotism, and by the way, it's the same thing in journalism. I imagine it's the same thing in the insurance business or the real estate business. But put that aside. They spent a day of the trial in which. They tried Joe and Hunter Biden. And that had as much, because there's an equivalency in the world in just about everything, 
but there's definitely one in the press and there's definitely one in politics. So your guy did this, but my guy did that and my guy did this, your guy did that. So uh, that, that hurt Joe Biden. And he doesn't have an answer for what happened, how Hunter got that job. I mean, Hunter was at McKinsey no. and he's a law grad who was with the David Boys law firm. You know, he's not he's not somebody without qualifications. But still, it stinks. You know, people don't like it. When it's right in your face, you don't like it, even though I practice it all the time. So um, there you go. I think that's what, what, what came out of impeachment is, this Joe Biden guy, oh, I don't know. And no one on the Democratic side ever made the distinction between Ukraine pre Zelensky and Ukraine now. Ah, Republicans yep. certified, Republicans, Senator Ron Johnson, among others, the Defense Department certified that the new Ukraine was uh, so, uh, was practicing such good government that they should get the funds that, that the Republican. Um, Congress uh, appropriated, and which Trump stopped. The old Ukraine was the one where the world community, the UN, Western democracies, and the, the U.S. went after the corrupt president and and prosecutors, the ones that Paul Manafort was working for. That do you think that distinction was made, Ed? I didn't. No. I didn't ever hear that clearly, crisply made. No. That was what Joe Biden got rid of with the entire Congress and the Western world. Hunter Biden was not under investigation by the good Ukraine. He went, Well, he wasn't under investigation by the bad Ukraine, but there wasn't anything that was going to happen to Hunter Biden as a result of Ukraine one. If you if you're following me, I think, yes. it, you know, now that I'm, now that I'm blithering about it. It's very hard to explain, isn't it? It gets so convoluted, and again, I think that's part of the problem with so many cable outlets and so many Internet outlets beating each other okay. up and, and just going at each other, trying desperately to get some eyeball somewhere. The American public is confused. I, I don't have any doubt about it. I read my social media pages, and I'm shocked sometimes at the people who not only mock that's normal, but there's just confusion. I used to tell people, Margaret, and we'll 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 close right on this because uh, you've been nice enough to spend a little more time with us than we originally talked about. Um, I used to tell people that with the internet, we have the ability now to be the smartest generation and the smartest that we've ever been in the history of the planet because it allows us to get news and information, factual news and information, within seconds, which we never had before. But then the answer coming back is, well, I don't know what's truthful and what's a lie. Said, really? There are ways then to do that, and there are legitimate sources to look at. But when you have all these sources going back and forth and they're just fighting, I think the American people are frighteningly confused, and no one's making it easy for them at this point. So they're going for the entertainment value. Would you agree with the entertainment value at least? <laughs> I do. And, yeah, unfortunately. And you, can help, you can help them. You can help them know what's true and what's not. We are trying. God I'm, I'm trying des yes. desperately, Margaret. Every day on my page, I'm trying desperately to throw it out there. And it's uh, that's why I come in and decided to do a show like this, because it's so much more fun. Uh, I want to remind everybody that the article that is currently out from Margaret Carlson is a brilliant article in the Daily Beast called, Here Are the Terrible Things Trump Did That You Might Have Missed in the midst of impeachment, and one of them involves the environment, which I'm a, I, I'm a, I'm a, a big follower of, and I'm constantly trying desperately to get people to pay attention to in so many ways. Uh, I want you to make sure to go to the Daily Beast, uh, some of her current articles as well, which is al always one of my favorites. When will Warren get sick of Bernie's mansplaining? Which might might exactly be one of the great headlines of all time. Uh, if you want to reach Margaret, you can reach her Twitter at Carlson Margaret. And she will be happy to engage with you there as well. Margaret, it has been a pleasure. We will absolutely do this again. Um, and uh, I hopefully, hopefully, somewhere down the line, uh, we will be able to change some minds and at least throw a little truth out there. Uh, keep up the great work, my friend. 
Thank you, Ed. Have a good weekend. All right. That is Margaret Carlson joining us here on The Man in the Arena. I want to remind uh, everybody once again that if you want to find us, make sure The Man in the Arena is also on audio podcast on all of the major outlets, if you will. Check us out there. And if you also want to then re-see the show, you can do so on Facebook. But if you go to welcometothearena.com, it's right there as far as our... our um, our lower third is concerned, uh, you'll be able to see it there as well. So you can go ahead and check out the replay of the show there. I want to thank once again Margaret Carlson. I want to thank the audience here. I want to thank everybody for being a part of this as we move forward and looking for interesting people and fascinating topics as well. I'm Ed Berliner. Until we meet again, everybody, rock on, true believers.